Christine Dreesen is a professional practitioner, lecturer, and teacher of the scientific system of healing called Christian Science, which is explained by Mary Baker Eddy in the book Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures. Christine began her public practice of spiritual healing in 1969. At the same time, she was pursuing a master's degree in French, teaching at Indiana University, and developing a career as a harpist and a dancer. At the fall of Saigon during the Vietnam War, Christine was asked to serve as director of the Indo-Chinese Refugee Legal Assistance Program for the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare and the American Bar Association. After receiving her Juris Doctorate, she entered private law practice, specializing in criminal, juvenile, and domestic law. She developed and directed a comprehensive rehabilitation program as an alternative to prison for women offenders and their children. This included counseling for addictive and domestic violence. She also served as head law librarian for a law firm specializing in hospital law. In 1993, she took a position as an attorney with the Committee on Publication, Legal, and Legislative Division at the First Church of Christ Scientist, advancing issues rela relating to spiritual healing. In this position, she lobbied in Washington, D.C., working on a Medicare bill and the Child Abuse Prevention and Treatment Act, and was asked to speak at the National Conference of Women Legislatures, Legislators about the care of children. In 1994, she gave up her work as an attorney to serve as manager of Sunday schools and youth activities and superintendent of the Mother Church Sunday School for four years, entering the full-time practice of Christian science in 1996 and becoming a teacher in 2003. At the same time, she was asked to serve as manager of the Christian Science Board of Lectureship. She has given many, many public lectures all around the world like this one, including a focus on Africa. She was also an invited speaker in all kinds of places from Harvard Medical School and Yale to interfaith conferences with all different kinds of uh, religions, Jewish, Muslim, Christian, etc. And she's given talks in hospitals, interviews on CNN. Um, she has a tremendous breadth in her in the different uh, speaking engagements that she's done. We are thrilled to have her here in Oregon. Please welcome Christine Dreesen. And thank you, Lisa. That was a beautiful introduction. And before I begin, she mentioned Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures, the book that was handed out. Even if you already have a copy of this, I'd highly recommend as we go through and look at some of the passages, if you have a friend, someone who's looking for healing, this is an opportunity to mark some of those passages with that person in mind, and when you go back, to be able to share that book with them. I find one of the things that brings healing quickest is when we pray for the world and pray for others. So this can be a good opportunity for starting that. Accessible, affordable, reliable health care. The public is demanding it. Congress and the president are working hard to come up with some solution, but is it even realistic to think that we could have a universally accessible health care system? And what about prayer? You're hearing more and more about prayer being used to supplement medical treatment. But could prayer be relied on exclusively to treat or to prevent disease, accident, aging? Well, the short answer to both those questions is Absolutely. And the long answer is we don't have to wait for years of very expensive medical research to find the answer. It's here today, and it's called Christian science. In fact, it was explained over a century ago, in scientifically in detail, by a woman named Mary Baker Eddy in her textbook on spiritual healing called Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures. Now, this system of healing is based on the teachings and the healing work over 2,000 years ago of the greatest physician who ever lived, the Jewish teacher, Jesus, who many people felt was the promised Messiah or Christ 
a savior for the world when it came especially to health questions, but any question. This healer, Jesus, Christ Jesus, healed every type of physical problem people face today, acute and chronic, congenital, contagious, hereditary, seasonal, terminal, even people who had passed on. And he said anybody who followed his teachings would be able to heal as he did. Now this um, system of healing, Mary Baker Eddy called the science of Christ or Christian science because a science is based on universal laws that anybody can study, put into practice, and prove for themselves. Christ refers to the divine healing principle that enabled Jesus to heal. This system, scientific system of mind healing, mind with a capital M, meaning the divine creative intelligence of the universe, has always been around eternally. And it has been accessible and is accessible to every single one of us, whether we're Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist, Jewish, Catholic, Baptist, even if we're atheist, even if we've rejected religion, this is a science available to everybody based on divine laws that govern every single one of us. Now, my family has seen the effectiveness of this system of healing for over four generations now. I have never had any medicine, drugs, inoculations, surgery, vitamins to maintain health. All my life, for many decades, I have relied exclusively on this system of healing and found it to be very reliable and accessible. My daughter, who's in her 30s, has chosen it for herself. And before I begin, I'd like to start with one little example of why I feel this is the most universally accessible and reliable form of health care there is. When my uncle was a young man, he joined the Air Force and was sent to Santa Ana Air Force Base to train to be a pilot. One day, my grandmother got a call from the hospital. The doctor said that he had contracted spinal meningitis. They had done everything they could to treat it, but he was now in a coma, and there was nothing more that they could do for him. They weren't even sure whether he would survive. They were waiting to see. Well, my grandmother's the one that discovered Christian science many years ago. She had seen over and over again the power of God to heal. So she had no question in her mind that there was nothing too hard for God, that God could heal this. So she called a Christian science practitioner, like that's what I do, and a Christian science practitioner, there are probably several in the audience today. Anyone here a Christian science practitioner? Yes. You got several hands going up. Very good. Can you raise your hand again if you're a Christian science practitioner? Ready to take cases? Very. Yes. Every single person who practices Christian science should be raising their hand. Thank you very much. And there's one over there, too. A Christian science practitioner prays for someone who's looking for healing based on these divine laws that I'm going to be talking about today. So, and this particular practitioner was a military chaplain. So he went to the hospital at the military base and began giving my uncle treatment through prayer in Christian science. That was a Friday. By Tuesday, he was out of the coma. The doctor said, even if he comes out of the coma, the possibility of him being able to function normally was slim to nil. He would most likely remain in a vegetative state because of the coma. He went right into therapy, excelled at that, went right into training, excelled at that, went on to fly planes, completely healed. You can imagine how comforting that was to my family. 
to know that there was something they could turn to with confidence. Psalms 103 in the Bible says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth thy life from destruction. And one of my favorite passages in the Bible, Psalms 46, says, God is a very present help in trouble. Therefore will we not fear, be still, and know that I am God. Silence the fear, the doubt, the questioning, and trust the power of God. So how did that happen? How was it that Christian science was able to heal a case of spinal meningitis when the medical treatments had failed? Well, if you take your science and health for a moment and turn to page 142, this is in the section Science, Medicine, and Theology, and you'll notice down towards the bottom is the title Medicine, and she says below that, God being all in all, he made medicine. But that medicine was mind, not matter. Throughout history, if you look in Bartlett's quote, book of quotations, the medical has always had the same joke, century after century. The cure is worse than the disease. Matter-based treatments have always had negative side effects. Spirit does not. And you heal with spirit, with the one divine mind. And if there is only one God, we'll be exploring this, one divine creative intelligence, and there can be only one mind. Paul, St. Paul in the Bible said, we need to have the mind of Christ. And he, Mrs. Eddy says, Paul summed up the complete system of Christian science over 2,000 years ago. In two verses, Romans 8, 1 and 2, she said that sums up what Christian science teaches. Is there anybody here who knows what Romans 8, 1 and 2 says there is you probably know this there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death what does that word mean condemnation who can tell me just Anybody can blurt out, what are some of the meanings of condemnation? Condemn. condemn. What does that mean to condemn something? Condemn. To throw down, to cast down, what else? Put to death. Put to death. What else? Yeah. Punish. Punish. Away. Take your property away. To damn. Damn. to damn someone, yeah, or something. What else? Blame. To blame. What happens when they condemn a building? What are they going to do to it? And why? It's no good, right. Ineffective. Unsafe. What happens when they condemn someone to prison or to, de to death? What are they saying? No hope. no hope. Hopeless. What else? Worthless. Worthless. What else? Guilty. Guilty. And that person's life has no more value. Well, the word... In the word Condemnation also means incurability, hopelessness. There is therefore now no incurability, no ineffectiveness, no worthlessness to God's creation. There is therefore now no incurability to them who are in Christ Jesus. What does that mean? He goes on to explain. Who walk not after the flesh, the five physical senses, human opinion, human ways and means. They always deceive. They promise and don't deliver. But who walk after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, he proved it, makes us free from the law so-called of sin, disease, and death. So we're going to take that passage tonight. And we're going to look at that in the context of three things. If you turn 
In Science and Health, Mrs. Eddy has a chapter, Christian Science Practice, How Do You Heal? And in that section, she's got, uh, in that chapter, she has a section called Mental Treatment Illustrated that begins on page 410. We'll be looking at that page a little bit more, but look at page 411, line 20. She explains, okay, if God is so good, why is there so much suffering? The procuring cause and foundation of all sickness is one of three things, ignorance, fear, sin. So we're going to look at that passage in light of those three things, and you'll see that's on your sheet. I'll be following that. So the first thing we'll look at is the Christ overcomes ignorance by revealing to human consciousness the true nature of God and man as perfect God, perfect creation eternally. Second, the Christ destroys sin by revealing to human consciousness because that is the activity of the Christ. Christ is divine love speaking to human consciousness meeting the human need. So the second thing is the Christ destroys sin by revealing to human consciousness our inherent goodness, purity, innocence, which can never be lost. And third, the Christ silences fear by revealing to human consciousness, to quote Mary Baker Eddy, that divine love is our only physician and never loses a case. So we're going to look at the first one, how the Christ overcomes ignorance by revealing to human consciousness the true nature of God and man. Now, many times you'll hear, perhaps you've been taught this, perhaps you've struggled with this thought, that maybe you can believe in prayer, maybe there's a God, but if there's a God, Something's wrong because he's pretty helpless. We're all down here struggling, tsunamis, wars, disease, and he just can't seem to help us. I don't know if he's too old or he's busy, maybe he's on vacation, but for some reason, he's not able to help us in spite of the fact that we all talk about him. Maybe it's that many, many years ago, centuries ago, he did some amazing things but he's getting on in years and he can't quite hear us anymore and it takes a little bit of time to get to us. No, it's not what the Bible says. That's not God. That's a superhuman, but it's not divine spirit. Or maybe we think sometimes, maybe this is God's will that I suffer. You know, maybe this is his plan for me. I've been reading the Bible every day for decades, beginning to end, in fact, I've read the Quran, or I'm reading the Quran, and the Jewish scriptures, and I am finding over and over again throughout the same message. God is the source of good alone. God is of two pure eyes to behold evil. God creates only good, and we'll look at that in a moment. It is never God's will that we suffer. He is love itself. If God is love, and I hear this in all the religions, if God is love, then love is the God of this universe. If God is good, then good is where the power is. And if God is all-powerful, then evil cannot have power. Sometimes we think, well, I'm suffering because this is punishment for my sins, or perhaps the sins of somebody else. Adam and Eve, long ago. If that's true, we're all doomed to suffer all the time because we all make mistakes. But that's not what I've found from the Bible, nor did Mrs. Eddy. From beginning to end, and especially the teachings of Christ Jesus, the message over and over again is infinite love is the God of this universe. And this love has a precious creation that it works very hard to maintain well, Mary Baker Eddy, the woman who discovered this science and wrote this book, was a devout student of the Bible from the time she was a child. She was a member of a Christian church, the Congregational Church, loved her church, loved the Bible, teachings of Christ Jesus. 
but she couldn't understand why good people would pray and not be healed. That did not make sense because Christ Jesus healed all the time and said, again, whoever followed his teaching would be able to heal as he did. So she couldn't understand why the churches were not healing, why her prayers weren't, weren't healing. And she began a search that went over for about 20 years, and I'll talk about part of the search in the second section. But her search was looking into, she tried medical, every type of alternative out there, homeopathy, hydropathy, Graham diet, spiritualism was big then, quimbyism, mesmerism, hypnotism. She was suffering from a lot of physical problems, back, internal, emotional, and wanted very much to find healing. And actually, as she was searching, one of the things she found was that she found relief from the homeopathic medicines, but it wasn't reliable. Plus, it excluded the Christ. And first of all, sometimes people say, Christ, that's a political term. I don't want to hear about that. I don't want the religion part. I just want the healing part. But remember, Jesus was a Jew. Christ and Christianity do not refer to churches today, because there were none of those. It refers to the healing power of love that Jesus demonstrated for everybody. And his followers said, every single one of us are supported and embraced by that. But the Christ, Christ Jesus, was the only one who had ever been able to heal like that. So she was sure that the healing method had to include the Christ. So she kept searching, and it was interesting, in spite of being flat on her back a lot, it was at a time when things got even worse. She finally was up, walking, going to a meeting with friends, fell on an icy street, was left unconscious, taken to a home nearby. The doctor came, left medicines for her, but he did not think she could recover from the effects of, those, of that fall. This time, however, rather than trying to pray to support the different medicines she was using, she chose to turn to God's spirit alone. Because the Bible says in Jeremiah, there is nothing too hard for God. God is the healer. Over and over again it says that. So she opened her heart to God, lifted her heart to God, and opened her Bible, and it fell open to Mark 3 in the New Testament, talking about Jesus. And her eyes fell on a healing. It was a man with a withered hand who hadn't even asked for help. And the man was healed instantly. She felt a change take place, taking place in her body as she read that. She realized she could get up out of bed, walked into the next room where her friends were waiting for her, thinking she was about to die. They were so surprised, they called the doctor back. When the doctor came back and heard that she had gotten better through prayer alone, he left in disgust. Have any of you ever been praying? felt like things were getting better, and then somebody came along, maybe a friend, family member, maybe a doctor, or somebody else, and they said, what? What are you, nuts? Prayer? You don't really think you can rely on prayer. And then you feel your confidence draining, and the problem seems to get worse. That's what happened to her. His disbelief affected everybody around him, and she had a relapse. But she refused to give in. She wasn't about to weigh in the scale the material with the spiritual or human opinion, no matter how educated, with divine law, evil in the scale with good. She was going to put all her weight in the scale of the divine. She picked up her Bible again and lifted her heart to God, asking for direction. And her Bible fell open again, this time to Matthew 9. It was the account of a man who had been paralyzed for a long time, unable to move. She could relate. She had been flat on her back 
for a number of years in and out of that condition. But when she read his words, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Rise up and walk. He didn't say, Sinner, that's why you're suffering. You shouldn't have done it. <laughs> he healed him. He healed him of the sin on the spot. He called him son, identifying him as a child of God. And then he said, rise up and walk. The man was healed on the spot. She realized, realized it wasn't God's will that we suffer, that God enables each one of us to overcome sin, disease, even death. Well, she ended up being completely healed. But she didn't stop there. She was determined to figure out how did that healing take place. And she began searching through the scriptures, especially Jesus' healings. Because as I said, he had healed every type of problem. He even healed <coughs> long-standing problems. Sometimes we think, okay, if I hurry up and start praying about this, I can heal it. But this one, this case, I've, boy, I've been suffering for this, from this for years. This one's too hard for God. Is anything too hard for God? No. Jesus was confronted with a case of a woman who had been bleeding continuously for 12 years. The doctors had tried everything, and they could not heal her. She was healed instantly. A woman who was bowed over, unable to walk, stand up, instantly freed. 18 years in that condition, instantly freed. There was a man who was paralyzed for 38 years in his bed. You can imagine he had gotten to the point where nothing's going to work. But he didn't. He kept expecting. But Jesus said, you don't have to wait for something to happen. You're already free. God made you that way. He told the man to pick up his bed and go home, and he was instantly healed. 38 years, gone, instantly. And even bringing people back from death. Because he taught God is our life, eternally. You can never be separated from God, so you can never be separated from life. There was a young girl, Jairus' daughter, who was very ill. Jairus said, please come quickly. But by the time Jesus got there, she had died. Jesus wasn't impressed. He knew there is no death. Life is eternal. He said, she's just sleeping. They laughed at him, took her by the hand, and she came right back, completely healed. There was a young man who had been dead for a little while. He was being carried to his grave, and Jesus stopped them and said no. And he brought him right back to life. And his friend Lazarus had been in the tomb four days. Sometimes people say, okay, in fact, I, I do a lot of medical talks. I have books by doctors on this topic. Medically documented that life does not end with death. Life is not in the body. goes right on. But sometimes they say, provided you can bring them back within a few hours or maybe a couple of days. Four days, the guy's gone. Jesus never believed that life was in the body. He called him out and Lazarus came right out went right back, young man, right back. Well, Mrs. Eddy wondered how was it that he was able to heal, because he said if we followed his teachings, and she found it's very simple, discussed in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. I have found the two points that Jesus stressed in all the religions that have lasted through the centuries. They may discuss them in different ways, use different terms, but they are the two great commandments. Anybody know what the first great commandment is? What is it? Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and soul and strength and mind. Have absolute trust that spirit is all in all. Spirit is your life. What is the second great commandment? Love your neighbors yourself. If love is the power of the universe, then live it. Let it fill your being. Let it govern your thoughts, your motives, your actions, your words. And then you will see that power of God operating in your life. And some of my friends were Buddhist or 
You know, Muslims use the Arabic word Allah. Some people call it a supreme being. Some people just talk about the power of love or the power of goodness. But that message, that Christ message, is spoken to people throughout the centuries from all the religions. The two great commandments are the foundation of healing. It's not hard. We make it hard. Because it's very easy to say, love your neighbors yourself, until somebody's mean to you, somebody undermines you, somebody lies about you, then it's not so easy to be loving. And Mrs. Eddy wondered, what, what is it that enables us to love unconditionally as God does. And her search took her to the very beginning of the Bible. Now, for 1,700 years, people had skipped over the beginning. They had started with the second chapter of Genesis, the story of Adam and Eve. How many of you read books by starting with chapter 2? Anybody? And yet chapter 1, she discovered, was a complete account of creation. Complete. It said that God's Spirit alone created and created everything. This entire universe is spiritual right now. Matter is simply the suggestion that substance can deteriorate and die. This is not material. This universe is spiritual, which means its substance is eternal, harmonious, healthful, every moment. This Genesis 1 says that this divine intelligence, spirit, created the entire universe. Good, 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 very good, and his work was finished. No mention of evil, no mention of disease or hate, suffering or aging, accident. But God was the only creator. Everything God made was very good. And his work was finished. Ecclesiastes 3.14 says, Whatsoever God doeth shall be forever. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken from it. You cannot add to God's creation disease, malfunctioning, hate, prejudice, fear. You cannot take from God's creation harmonious action, proper functioning of organs, proper growth of cells, Everything in this creation must manifest the harmony and intelligence of spirit because that's the way God made it. And it says right from the beginning of the Bible, God's spirit made man and it defines man. All these centuries that women were thinking they were inferior, it was always there. God created man, male and female, in the divine image and likeness. Not an anthropomorphic God, angry sometimes like a human, sometimes kind. No. A creation made in the divine image and likeness of God, spirit, life, truth, love. We, every single one of you, is that divine creation. Does God get sick? I've never seen that in the Bible. Does God die? No. Does God hate? No. So we cannot because we are God's creation. Mrs. Eddy found, in fact, it says in there, God created each of us to succeed, to prosper, to multiply. He blessed his creation. And that's each one of us. She found in Genesis 1 a scientific basis for praying with confidence. That is the divine law of our being, that we are good and perfect because we are made in the divine image and likeness. Reflection, like the sun, like the rays of the sun. Each ray has all the qualities of the sun. You don't get any cold rays that I know of or dark rays. And each of us are like the manifestation of the sun, manifestation of life, truth, and love. Well, this enabled her to heal Every case that she was amazing healings and to teach others to heal. Now, one of the things she stressed that she found, and I'm going to, we're about to go to the second point, but in each of these points, I'm going to give you one of Jesus' healings and a healing today. Because I find each of Jesus' healings help us to understand better how to heal with confidence, with scientific certainty. Okay, and I'm going to look at three of those. 
But before I look at this first story, one of the, you know, ignorance, we're talking about not knowing who God is. One of the misconceptions is that because the Christ was manifested in the form of Jesus to demonstrate what does it mean to be the child of God, what does it mean to face hatred and dishonesty and suffering and still be, have your trust in God. When Jesus was brought to trial and lied about and abandoned and betrayed and then crucified, he was demonstrating the two great commandments, absolute confidence that nobody had power apart from God. Evil was not a power and love for mankind. On the cross, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He never attached evil to person. The problem is, a lot of times people think Jesus was so good. If only I could see Jesus. If only I could teach, touch Jesus. Got to wait till Jesus comes back before I can be healed. That's not what Jesus taught. Jesus said, why callest thou me good? There's none good but one, God. I can of mine own self do nothing. It is the spirit that quickeneth, giveth life. The, pro the, the flesh profiteth nothing. Human ways and means, flesh can't help you. A fleshly person. He said, the words that I speak, the Christ message, that is what gives you life. Don't turn to a person. We don't have to go through a doctor or a priest or a minister or a Christian science practitioner to get to God. Each one of you is one with your maker. Each one of you has a direct connection, and the Christ is speaking to human consciousness every moment. Certainly a minister or a priest or a practitioner can be supporting you in prayer if they're praying from that basis of the allness of God and the nothingness of a power apart from God. But to illustrate, the example I want to give you was the healing of the centurion's servant. Because if you know what a centurion is, anybody know what a centurion is? Roman commander in an army. And so he had to answer to, emperor, to the emperor. So he had somebody with greater authority over him. And he also had people under him that he had authority over. So he asked Jesus, sent his friends, see if Jesus would come and heal. I mean, asking Jesus if he would heal his servant. And Jesus, being so compassionate, always wanted to meet the human need. People were used to saying, please come, please come. They wanted to touch him. They wanted to be close to him. And so he started going with the friends to the house of the centurion. But the centurion saw him coming. And he sent his friends back saying, you don't need to come to my house. I don't need your physical presence here. I'm not even worthy for you to come into my house. All you have to do is speak the word. Genesis 1, in the beginning was the word. John 1, in the beginning was the word, the Christ. That message of the allness of God and man's oneness with God. Perfect God, perfect man. All you have to do is speak the word and my servant will be healed. I understand you are a man of authority. The authority comes from God. You speak God's word, and healing must result. He said, I understand that. I'm a man under authority. I say to this man, go, and he goes. I say to this one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and I have no question in my mind that it will be done because I have authority. You have authority too. The Christ is the power of God to heal. When you declare that word of God, Isaiah 55 says, when that word goes forth, it never returns void. It must accomplish that for which it was purposed. And the centurion understood that. He said, if you say, pronounce that word of God, my servant will be healed. And Jesus said, you're the only one that gets it in all of Israel. You're the only one that understands what I'm saying. It is not person, it is divine principle that heals. And we need to realize that. 
that principle speaking to you every moment. Well, the healing I want to tell for this first point, the second and third points are much shorter because we've laid the foundation. But the healing was the healing of my cousin when he was about 12 years old. My cousin Phil. He went with his mom to the shopping center, and you know how much 12-year-olds love going shopping with their moms. He was thrilled, stayed in the car, but she said, stay in the car till I get back. No sooner had she left than he saw a construction site, big machines, jumps out of the car and starts running to see the machines. He was struck by a speeding car. Before my aunt could get to him, the ambulance had come. They had given him drugs to uh, allay the seriousness. I don't know what they do with the drugs, but they gave him drugs. Deep gash in the head, internal injuries, multiple broken bones. By the time he got to the hospital, he had had such a negative reaction to the drugs that they thought he would die. They took him off the drugs, put him aside in a room, bandaged the head, and the doctor, when my aunt arrived, told her they did not know if he would survive the night. They would have to wait and see. My aunt had seen my grandmother's healing. She had had healing. She had healed other people already. She had confidence that Christian science could heal and would heal, that God was right there with her child. So she sat outside his room that night and prayed the Lord's Prayer. And if you open your Science and Health, the very first chapter is a chapter on prayer because Mrs. Eddy had prayed for so long and hadn't found healing. And then when she did discover how to heal, that healing has to be based on understanding the allness of God. It can't be blind faith. She wrote this chapter, and if you look at pages 16 and 17, she has the prayer that Christ Jesus gave the world. He said, every single one of us are children of God, our Father. And Mrs. Eddy has put a spiritual interpretation there based on everything she read in the Bible and the teachings of Jesus. And as my aunt prayed with that, our Father, Mother, God, all harmonious. If God was the father, mother of her child, and God is everywhere, filling all space, all knowing, all seeing, all acting, Mrs. Eddy says, then her child could never have been separated from God's care. Her child could never have wandered from that parent love. It says, thy will be done in earth as in heaven. Enable us to know as in heaven, so on earth. God is omnipotent, supreme. There's no condition outside of God's care and control. It says God does not lead us into temptation, but delivers us from sin, disease, and death. So her child could not have been tempted to do something unwise. God was expressing wisdom in him. And it says, for God is infinite, all life, all truth, love, all power, so her son could never be separated from God, who was his life. Well, the next day, the doctor came back with a team of young doctors to see what had happened. Not only was my cousin Phil doing much better, but when they took off the bandage, the wound had already started closing up. Now, they were very concerned because it had been multiple broken bones. They put him in a cast from his neck down to his foot. And my uncle was not a Christian scientist. He had begun studying. In fact, he had prayed about a couple little things for himself, began to see how it worked, but it, this was his son, his son's life. So my aunt let him make the choice. Did he want medical, or did he want to rely on Christian science? She felt that was the most loving thing, so that he would feel comforted. She knew God was in control, but she wanted him to be at peace. So he asked the doctor, when is my son going to walk? And the doctor said, the breaks are so serious, we don't know. It'll be at least six months before we can tell. Well, my uncle decided, you know, they didn't know if he'd live. My aunt was confident he was doing much better. They didn't know if he'd walk. So he made the decision to rely on Christian science treatment exclusively. They took him home 
removed the cast and just kept a little brace. And they began praying from that basis that this is a science based on divine universal laws, always in effect, always maintaining health. So that man, if he was governed by the law of spirit, he was not governed by a law of chance. Accidents are the belief that we're governed by chance. Maybe God's in control, maybe he's not. Heaven only knows where he is when there are accidents because the Bible says God alone governs and he governs everything in absolute harmony. So there cannot be accidents. He's not governed by a law of physiology that says muscles and bones move him and can be broken. The Bible says none of his bones shall be broken. Well, the prognosis had been six months. Six weeks later, he went to a Boy Scout troop meeting, started playing basketball with his friends, went home and said, Dad, do I have to keep this brace on? He said, no, of course not. Took it off. A couple weeks later, left with his Boy Scout troop on a 50-mile hike, completely healed months before they thought they would know whether he could walk again. There is therefore now no condemnation, no prognosis of incurability, of too hard for God, no prognosis, no, no condemnation of accident to those who are in Christ Jesus, who keep their trust in God's message of the allness of God's spirit and the powerlessness of a suggestion of life and matter. Well, the second and third ones will go much quicker. The second one was the Christ destroys sin by revealing to human consciousness our inherent goodness and innocence and purity, which we can never lose. Now, I've had many instantaneous healings in my life from the time I was a child, but sometimes you have a problem and you keep praying and it seems to go on and on and on. Every single time, for me, the healing has come when I've gone back to those two great commandments. Love God's spirit with all your heart and soul and mind. Trust that spirit is the source of your life not weighing human opinion and the scale with the divine, and loving your neighbor as yourself. And for me, it was usually, no matter what the physical problem, it was usually handling resentment or criticism or feeling like somebody was undermining my happiness. And each time when I said, wait a second, isn't God in complete control? And began embracing everyone in that love, physical problem was gone. So... Mrs. Eddy says, she's got a very broad definition of sin, in case any of us think those are the sinners and I'm not. She said, it is a sin to believe that anything can overpower omnipotent spirit. So we're all working with that, right? <laughs> but what helped her to understand how to handle that belief of sin was going back, we talked about Genesis 1, but Genesis 2 and 3, the story of Adam and Eve, is very important. Even though it's an allegory, throughout history, people have used allegories, fables, fairy tales to explain to children and adults, okay, if God's so good, why am I suffering? And it's a very, just like it follows the pattern of all the stories, allegories, fables. They all have talking animals, unrealistic situations, but you remember them. The story of Adam and Eve in Genesis 2 and 3 is very important to understand because it explains why we seem to get off track, either with sin or with fear. So let's talk about sin first, number two. It says, remember Genesis 1, how was man created in Genesis 1? Who was the creator? God, good, father, mother, a, word, a synonym for God right at the beginning that starts with S. Spirit created all. Spirit is the opposite of matter. Matter is that which is self-destructive, temporal. Spirit is that which is eternal, harmonious. Genesis 1, entirely a spiritual creation. Genesis 2 starts all over again. 
This time man is created of the dust of the ground. Dust in the Bible represents death, matter, material, materiality. And it says man is made of the dust of the ground and he's made capable of making all sorts of mistakes. But this mortal man is told there are two symbols. There is a tree of life and the message is hold to that. And there's another tree that represents the suggestion that there are two powers, good and evil, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the serpent, which represents subtle, aggressive suggestion that says you are material, it says you will be wiser. In fact, you'll be happier. In fact, you'll be richer. In fact, you'll be very satisfied if you believe that there is more than one God, that God good is not the only power, evil is also a power, that spirit is not the only creator, matter is also a creator. Genesis 2 and 3 break the commandments from beginning to end. You would never want to follow those. You'd never want to believe that was true about God's creation because it denies God. Genesis 2 and 3 are not there to tell us what is true, but what is false about creation. It breaks all of God's commandments. God would never say it was true. But that serpent suggestion suggests you will be so satisfied if you think of yourself as sensual and material, and, and you'll be like the gods. How many gods were there in Genesis 1? One. Genesis 2 says, no, no, there are many gods, and you can be a god too. The serpent, the suggestion that you are material. You may be spiritual too, but you're also material, and that's a good thing. Gives you power, gives you strength. Evil can be good sometimes. That serpent suggestion always promises heaven. You'll be like the gods and always delivers hell and nothing short of it. What happens to Adam and Eve? Do they become gods? They lose everything, their inheritance, they're naked, ashamed, cursed. Genesis 1 didn't curse, God didn't curse his creation, he blessed them. They weren't ashamed, they were precious in God's eyes. Genesis 2, they are cursed. What are men cursed with? Anybody know? Uh huh, but more specifically, tilling the soil, men will have to struggle in life and never make it, you know. You know, like rolling that proverbial stone up the mountain and it rolls right back again. Struggling in life and never quite making it. You know, your investments were getting up there and up there and they're gone today. That's the material view of man. Man was cursed to struggle in life and never quite make it. You've lost your inheritance. What were women cursed with? Suffering and everything having to do with childbearing. They were the ones to be carrying the child, bringing a child into life. But what did Genesis 1 say? Who's the creator? God's spirit. Eternally, man has always existed. There's no birth process. That's just God unfolding to human consciousness, a right idea, a precious child. I learned, and this is a message to women right now, I learned that we never have to accept that in our experience. Everything that you hear today about women comes from that belief that women descend from Eve and that women are cursed to suffer and everything having to do with childbirth. When I was a teenager, I used to be doubled over in pain with menstrual pains. I mean, I thought I was going to die. And I would pray, and the pain would go away, but then the next time it'd come back. And I suddenly stopped in the middle of one of those times and said, what am I accepting? This is the belief that I descend from Eve, that I'm cursed to suffer because I bear children. No. I don't bear children. These are God's ideas. God unfolds them in our experience. It's effortlessly. There's no pain involved. That was the end of the menstrual pains. And I don't even know what all the other names are that the material world's trying to attach to women. 
what are they, PMS and, you know, all these things before, during, after I had my daughter at home, natural childbirth, wonderful experience, great afterwards, feeling such a sense of God's gift coming into my life, and that thing they call menopause. Do not ever accept that that's true. There's nothing attached to that. There's no ending to that. I mean, that stopped long ago to stop. You know, there was nothing more. Do not expect that you have to suffer because somebody is labeling you. Whether you're male or female, you are not cursed. You are God's precious children. Well, from that story came the belief of sin, that God made you capable of making the wrong decision, and God never did. Mrs. Eddy says there's a definition in here. You can look real quickly. Page 475, the definition of man refers to every single one of us. When you read it, you can substitute in your name or anybody else. And at the bottom of that page, she says, man is incapable of sin, disease, and death. God never made man capable of disobeying him. God expresses intelligence and wisdom in every one of us. The reason Adam and Eve seed into sin is because they believe both good and evil were powers. But the man of God's creating knows only good, is responsive only to that Christ message. Well, the two examples I want to give you, one is the healing of a blind man. Jesus was walking with his disciples, and there along the side of the road was a man who had been blind since birth, they said. And they said to Jesus, what caused this? Who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus said, you're asking the wrong question. This man's not blind. God does not create blindness. This man was never born. There's no birth process. God is his life, and he lives eternally. He said, you're asking the wrong question. Neither has this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God be, may be made manifest. We're tempted all the time to look for a cause, to listen to what the physical senses say. Oh, I felt a pain. I wonder what caused it. Oh, I heard that there's a disease going around. I think I have it. I wonder what caused it. It gets us to believe we could have something God never created and then to look for a cause for it. But God's man is not a sinner, and God's man is not capable of being sick. Jesus takes the man, and he spits in the dust. In the Bible, spitting is a sign of contempt. Remember, dust represents the Adam creation, man created materially, capable of dying, of being sick. He spits on that false concept, makes mud of it, wipes us on his eyes, and then says, that's what's keeping you from seeing. Go wash your eyes off. Wash that false concept of man that says your material that's blocking your ability to see God's perfect creation. The guy goes and washes it off, comes back seen clearly. We do not have to accept or allow our vision of God's creation to be covered over by that false sense of two creations or a material origin. We never were. And when we see that our origin has always been good and pure, it enables us to handle sin. So the final example for number two that I'd like to share is when I received a call from a mother in tears asking for help. She had a teenage daughter who had begun running away from home from the time she was about 12 years old. In fact, she was on the run continuously for a few years. She'd be gone months at a time, hanging out with a particular gang, into drugs, alcohol, sexually promiscuous. She used to be a very loving, gentle child. She'd become angry and violent. And she was back in jail again. But this time, the court was fed up with her. They didn't want any more to do with her hopeless throw away, this one's not worth it. They were going to send her to lock up in another state. Her mother was desperate because 
The reason the court was fed up was she wouldn't go through drug treatment or alcohol treatment. She wouldn't talk to anybody. She wouldn't even talk to her parents. And her mother felt like she was going to begin believing what she was hearing. People saying, you know, this is a hopeless case. She's not worth anything anymore. And she didn't want her to believe that. She knew it wasn't true. But she said, my daughter won't listen to me. And I said, there's only one God, the divine creative intelligence of the universe, which is love itself. There's only one mind. Speaking through that Christ message, which is God's love meeting the human needs, speaking to human consciousness, it is speaking to her every moment. It is the only voice she can hear because there's only one mind. She loves the message of this Christ love because it's telling her how precious she is. And she is obedient to it because that's the natural state of God's children. You can trust that. You need to go down to that jail and talk to her and let her know she has, in God's eyes, she has not lost her innocence and goodness. God still sees her as good and pure and innocent. God loves her, and she can never lose that. She said, but she'll never listen to me. And I said, you can be affirming in prayer that the Christ is speaking to her right now. Job 32, 8. There's a spirit in man. And the inspiration of the Almighty giveth them understanding. Romans 8, 16, 17. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. The, that's the Christ message speaking to each one of us every moment. I said, trust that. And then I had her look at a passage that I found very helpful. Look at page 63. This paragraph that starts at line five, you can, once again, it's all about who we really are. And I told her, read this substituting in your daughter's name, thinking about her. You could substitute in your name, the name of a loved one, the name of somebody you don't love so much, and see what it says about them. In science, your daughter is the offspring of spirit, not matter. You know how when you think of yourself as material, sometimes it's easy to accept that you've got certain tendencies, maybe personality tendencies, maybe that you've become addicted to alcohol or drugs or sensuality or chocolate or, <laughs> not chocolate, chocolate's okay, but <laughs> shopping. <laughs> But whatever it is, and you're, you're praying so hard, it seems that you try so hard, and it seems to be controlling your life, messing up your life, and you pray, and you try so hard, but it seems impossible to break away. You know, it's like a magnetic hold on you, no matter how hard you try. But I said to her, if you took the world's most powerful magnet, one that could stop a speeding truck, pull it in the opposite direction, and then you turn this powerful magnet on a little bird, it would have no effect on the bird because the bird has no qualities which respond to the pull of magnetism. Your daughter being a spiritual idea has no qualities which respond to the pull of animal, which means material, magnetism. Which She has no qualities which respond to the pull of drugs, alcohol, sensuality. She is a spiritual idea and responds only to the attraction of spirit. The beautiful, good, and pure constitute her ancestry, not the rebellious and angry. She was a, an adopted child from another race, another nationality. She felt like she didn't know who her father was, her mother. She didn't know who her family was, so she was hanging around with this gang who kept getting her in trouble, thinking that was family. Very confused. No, the beautiful, good, and pure constitute your ancestry. Your origin is not like that of mortals and brood instinct. She's not governed by hormones or by a need to, you know, teenagers needing to rebel to preserve who they are, to establish their identity as an adult. No. Her origin was that of God's precious child, nor does she have to passed through material conditions prior to reaching intelligence. She didn't have to learn the hard way. She already expresses intelligence and wisdom. 
Spirit was her primitive and ultimate source of being, not Adam and Eve. God was her father, mother, and life was the so source of her being. She already was conscious of her true parent and had never been separated from that parent. Well, this mom went down to the jail and began praying from that basis and talking to her daughter. Her daughter liked so much what she was hearing, she began listening to her mom. They began talking. The court changed its decision, decided to release their daughter to the parents' custody so they could take her home once more. This young girl told me later, when she got home, the urge to run was so great, but something told her, no, stay there and listen to your mom. What was that something told her? The Christ. Even atheists who say they don't believe in God, you hear people going, something told me I shouldn't have turned down that street. The Christ speaks to every single one of us every moment. The something told me, it's wisdom, goodness speaking to us. Well, she said she, that was telling her, stay there, so she did. She listened to her mom. She began loving much more what she was learning from her mother, that she was good and innocent and pure and hadn't lost it. She ended up going back to school. She stopped hanging out with that gang because she didn't like what they were saying anymore. The drugs and alcohol, she dropped immediately. Smoking took a few months, but she dropped that too. But she realized she was pregnant. And she decided she wanted to keep that baby so she could re raise her son to learn about what she was learning, how much God loved her and that God was his father, mother too. She finished high school. She went on to college, started a mother's self-help group in college for other young moms who had had babies out of wedlock. And her parents said she was such a strong support to them. But she told me she could never have broken away from that lifestyle if her parents had not seen her as good and beautiful and innocent and pure because she said she had heard the negative stuff so much she said nothing she would do would ever change the way people thought about her. But her parents changed that because they saw her as good and innocent and pure. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus when we see our fellow man as God's precious, innocent, and pure children. That enables them to be free from that belief of sin. Well, the third point is that the Christ silences fear by revealing to human consciousness that, as Mrs. Eddy said, divine love is our only physician and never loses a case. Nothing is too hard for God. Now, the problem is, Mrs. Eddy says over and over again, fear is the first thing you need to handle. Fear is mesmerizes. It's like a hypnotist. Remember, Genesis 2 and 3 has a serpent, which represents subtle, aggressive suggestion. And that serpent, as it goes through the Bible, the image that they're using becomes devil, which is something that actually is talking to you openly. Person, this person is evil. They're telling me this and that. They're undermining my happiness. By the end, it's swollen into a giant dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns. I never could quite figure out how you could have seven heads and ten and seven, but it was a horrendous dragon. But it was nothingness. It says the Christ, the dragon represents, once again, this aggressive suggestion. Devil doesn't mean person. It means accuser, prosecutor. That which accuses you, like the serpent, of being material, accuses you of being a sinner, of capable of being mortal and dying. That accusation has swollen itself to a dragon threatening to destroy you with its angel messages. Angel means messages, and it could be messages from God or the carnal mind saying, no, 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 you're going to suffer. But the Christ, it says in Revelation 12, cast out that dragon with all of its negative suggestions. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 5 says, the weapons of our warfare, 
are not carnal, but mighty through God, to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations. It's right there in the Bible. Imaginations and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. The Christ silences that negative thinking that causes us to be afraid. Now, when Mrs. Eddy was first for 20 years trying to find better health, she went through a period of experimenting, I said, with many kinds of alternatives. Medical had failed, homeopathy, hydropathy. During that period of experimentation, she healed a number of people. One was a woman dying of dropsy. Um, it, it might have been called rheumatic fever. She healed somebody of rheumatic fever as well using sugar pills. She didn't want them to have drugs. The doctors had given up on them. But she was praying, and the person, this woman, said, I want a drug. I'm afraid to not have my medicine. So she gave her a sugar pill while she was praying, and the woman recovered completely. Mrs. Eddy felt that that was the first falling apple of her discovery. She called it human enlightenment. She realized, wait a second, all this time we've been praying to get rid of a disease. God, please come down and get rid of this disease I have. And she realized, wait a second, it's all mental, imaginations, hypnotism, mesmerism. When the person thought they were taking a drug, it went away and they were healed. She realized the mental nature of all suffering, and that was the first step to being able to make prayer effective. The second came with when she turned to God exclusively. She called that revelation. And when she saw that God's spirit was the only power, that's when the complete healing came. How many of you know what a placebo is? Who can tell me what a placebo effect is? Anybody? What's, do you know what placebo effect is? A placebo is, uh, it has no medication in it. Right. It's just a... <laughs> like a sugar pill. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly, and placebo effect is a medical term that refers to when a person thinks they're getting a drug, a medicine, a treatment, and they get better. They may be completely healed, but they never were given anything. It was all mental. Anybody know what nocebo effect is? Ever heard of that? Nocebo effect. It's the opposite. It is the opposite, and it's when a person thinks they've been exposed to a disease, something contagious, something noxious in the air, or accident, and they develop the symptoms, they may suffer from it, they may even die, but they were never exposed to it. And they have medical examples of this. And in fact, maybe on your sheet, Mrs. Eddy, 100 years ago, before the medical even started experiment, um, documenting it, she documents examples of both placebo and nocebo effect. Anybody ever heard of placebo surgery? Happens all the time, but they don't talk about it. They use placebo surgery to test different kinds of surgery, heart disease, Parkinson's disease, arthritis of the knees, manic depression, and the list goes on. I, what I'm going to share with you now comes from a transcript from two doctors in Boston who have done a lot of experimentation with placebo and nocebo effect. I want to share this with you because I'm telling you all suffering is mental. And you're maybe saying, I don't think so. I know when it's real. The doctors, they have many examples of this. This was an example of when the doctors took a group of people who had been diagnosed with heart disease. They were told that they had a surgery that would help them with the heart disease. Half the people got the surgery. The other half were told they had surgery, but they just got a little slit that was sewn up. The group that had surgery over the next six months had a 75% recovery rate. The group that had been diagnosed with heart disease, told they were going to have surgery but had no intrusion in the body, recovered 100%. That doesn't happen if disease is real. It is all mental fear, ignorance, sin. Mesmerize us into believing we could suffer. And 
I, I have a definition of terrorism that I usually use for my talk on um, a spiritual response to violence and terrorism, but terrorism applies to anything. The terrorism of disease. We are in a period, and if you've been around long enough, you will know that this is just a period. It hasn't been this way all the time. Most of you are too young to have ever been in that period. Um, this was just in the last few decades. The pharmaceutical companies have been working overtime to sell fear. They are selling disease. They're creating disease. There are books out by doctors accusing the medical and the pharmaceutical of, of creating fear that is causing disease by saying, oh, you're going to get this, you're going to get that. Do you feel this? It must be called this. Only with this drug will you be saved. And yet the diseases keep multiplying. It's selling fear. This definition of terrorism is taken from the Harper's Dictionary of Modern Thought. I love dictionaries. And I, I don't know what religion the people are. Maybe they don't even have religion, um, a religion, the people who are the editors of this dictionary. But this is their definition of terrorism. The policy of using terror, the fear of death, to break the spirit of resistance to a particular group. As a policy, it lacks reality. As a policy, it lacks reality until sufficient examples have been provided for the terror to become effective. It is essentially the weapon of a minority that sees no chance of success by persuasion. There's no truth in what they say. They just have to keep showing you pictures of disease. You've got this. You're going to die in three months. You better have that removed. You better have the surgery. And they keep showing the pictures till you become so afraid, you go ahead with it, you believe it, and then it suddenly seems to be real. That is what terrorism is. If the terror is to be successful, it must first impose its will on those that it wishes to control. And that is what is being done right now. This isn't just Christian scientists that are saying this. There are many books coming out now by people from all backgrounds. There are medical doctors challenging this practice. In fact, you may have seen the article, I think it was New York Times last year, what we're suffering from in this country is an epidemic of diagnoses. And it says, you thinking about getting a diagnosis for cancer? Don't. A, a medical doctor from Mayo a number of years ago said, what we are doing is criminal. We must not be telling healthy people, you're going to, you have cancer. We see it right here. You're going to die in three months because the fear makes them believe it. Fear is like a hypnotist. Anyone who has studied hypnotism or gone and seen a hypnotist knows a hypnotist can make you believe anything they suggest. They can make you believe you have a disease, that you're suffering, that you're dying, simply by suggestion. You will see it, you will feel it, you will experience it, and they can make everyone around you. Ever see the movie Manchurian Candidate? About how they, the American soldiers were hypnotized, believing they were sitting at a tea party and and when they did something, it wasn't really shooting the person that they had just killed. They can make you believe anything, but they will tell you they have no control over you whatsoever unless you give your, yeah, your consent or permission. They have no control over you. Do not give your consent to being controlled by fear. 2 Timothy 1, 7 says, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. God never created disease. God is the only creator. God is all powerful. Therefore, disease has no power over you. And the other thing I would say is never give up. I say this when I'm talking to doctors. Do not ever give up. The other thing that's come in with the fear 
and it snuck in through hospice care, which has the purpose of treating people as human beings and loving them and not treating them as objects or machines. But in with that hospice care came the, the decision, OK, everybody's going to die sometime, so when do we give up? And doctors stepped in and said, we'll tell you when it's time to give up. Don't ever give up. When you accept that, failure becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. You don't fail because there was a disease. You fail because you expected it to fail. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Don't ever give up. The healing I want to tell you about with Jesus kind of helps us to look at this. It was the account of a child who had been suffering from severe case of epilepsy. Doctors had tried everything. They weren't able to heal him. The disciples tried healing him, and they couldn't heal him, even though they had healed people. So they brought him to Jesus. And Jesus said, if you can only believe. And the father said, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. That's the weighing the material and the scale with the spiritual. And so Jesus made the separation. He ordered the word is demons or devils, meaning all those negative suggestions out of the child. And then the child fell down dead. Have you ever been praying about something really confident? You declare the truth about God and man, and then the problem gets worse? Has that ever happened? That happens sometimes. That's the nature of what Paul describes the carnal mind, resisting its own destruction by going from serpent suggestion to devil suggestion to huge dragon. Now look what's happened. The child's dead. You shouldn't have said anything. <laughs> Jesus was never impressed by what the physical senses were telling him. Didn't matter what people around him were saying. He was obedient only to God. His confidence was in God alone. He picked up the child, and that was the end of it. The child was completely healed, never impressed by the picture in front of him. Well, the disciples came to him afterwards and asked the same kind of questions we may have asked. Why couldn't I heal him? I don't understand. Jesus said two things to him. First, he said, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, remove hence, and it'll move. Because the only substance of creation is spiritual. Everything is in mind, not in matter. Remember the movie uh, Matrix? They talked a lot about that in there. That was a, the first one was very metaphysical in some parts. <laughs> right? <laughs> but he said to them, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, a mustard seed is very tiny, but it's whole. A child's faith is very tiny. They don't have a doctoral degree in divinity, but their healings, my healings as a child were instantaneous. I prayed for myself any time, and I was a pretty wild child, running with my jar of snakes or spiders and fell on a cement walk with glass in me. No fear whatsoever. A neighbor came running over, so afraid I was bleeding. I said, oh, it's OK. I'll pray. Just help me take it out. She was supposed to be watching me while my mom was gone. <laughs> Woo! But it didn't matter. I was not the least bit afraid. I knew I could not be hurt. Went and washed it off and went back playing. Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is already within you. Health, wholeness, strength, dominion, peace. But you have to be as a little child to see it. What is it about the childlike thought that enables children, of course, since we've always existed, children come into this world already complete. They already know God. It's the material world that hides it. The more you listen and learn about the material world. Little children are absolutely receptive to healing. Why? What qualities of thought, spiritual qualities, do they express before the material world starts pulling it away? Innocence, what else? Purity, what else? Trust, what else? Meekness, what else? 
love. And that goes back to the, probably the most important quality they express, forgiveness. They are so quick to forgive. Jesus on the cross, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That's what enabled Jesus to be resurrected. He couldn't have done it without it. The childlike thought never judges or attaches evil to person. They forgive instantly. And their healings are instant. And they trust completely. My daughter, um, who's in her 30s now, when she was little was an excellent swimmer. You know how you do the mother-daughter, mother-baby thing at the YMCA when they're 10 months old? She was going off the high dive by the time she was two, could swim down to the bottom of the diving well, very good swimmer. Well, one day, two years old, she was climbing the ladder to go down the slide. She slipped. I was right there by her, but she slipped and fell to the cement below and gashed her chin open. I instantly scooped her up in my arms. And I said, sweetheart, you can never be separated from God's loving care. Not even for an instant. And I began singing to her a, a poem by Mary Baker Eddy that she loved. It's a hymn we sing. Mother's Evening Prayer, it says, O gentle presence, peace and joy and power, O life divine that owns each waiting hour, thou love, God, that guards the nestling, the baby bird's faltering flight, keep thou my child on upward wing tonight. Well, I was carrying her to the bathroom to wash it off. I was singing to her. She stopped crying immediately. Humanly speaking, it was a deep gash that was bleeding. But I was, I was affirming her oneness with God that she could never fall out of God's care. And I was singing to her and washing it off. And suddenly, she jumps off my lap and starts running towards the pool. And I go, where are you going? Stop. She goes, swim, swim. I stopped her and looked. It was already closed. The gash was already closed up, an instantaneous healing, because the little child does not have time for ruminating. They have much more important things to do. They need to be playing. If it was an adult, they would go, oh my gosh, did you see that? Oh, it happened to my friend. I need stitches. It'll take forever. Children don't have time for that kind of garbage. Don't ever ruminate. Don't ever rehearse what the physical senses are telling you. You have much more important things to be doing, rejoicing in God's allness. Her healing was so quick, the next day you couldn't even see where the line was. We need that childlike thought. So he said, if you have a gr faith as a grain of mustard seed, tiny, you may be brand new to this, but let your trust in God be whole. The second thing is, he said, this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. And Mrs. Eddy, Mary Baker Eddy, the author, has another book called First Church of Christ Scientists and Miscellany. It's actually a lot of her articles and letters and things. And in there, on page 222, she, def she talks about this healing and defines the word fasting. She says, it is refraining from admitting the claims of the senses. Now, the word admit has two meanings. One is to say something is true. Do you admit that you could have this disease? And you say, no. God never created disease. I refuse to admit that could be true. But the second meaning of the word admit is to allow in, to permit to enter. So you have a dishonest salesman at your door, and he says, I can sell you the most beautiful condo on Mars for only $50,000. Here, sign here, and you're going, what? There's no way I could admit that could be true. He says, okay, wait. Just let me come into your house for a moment and show you some of my pictures. Look at this gorgeous living room and the kitchen and the swimming pool ready to sign. Well, if you let him in the house, you might be tempted to sign. Are there any condos on Mars? <laughs> I don't think so. But that's what we seem to do. We declare the truth and then... The carnal mind says, wait a second, let me just come into your house, your consciousness, and let me show you some pictures. Remember, look at this. This one is contagious, picture of the office. They all had the flu. You were there. Oh, you're right. 
Maybe I am getting the flu. Don't look. It shows you a picture. Remember, this one's hereditary. Your parents had it. Their parents had it. You're right. I've had it before myself. Do not open the door, she says. Page 390. Stan Porter at the door of thought. Do not allow into your consciousness pictures. The suggestion is if you only knew what it was called, if you could just get a diagnosis, if you could just see a picture of it, then you'd know what to handle. No. Once it's in, then you got a lot to handle. There's nothing there. God never created disease, so you do not have to find out what it's called or where it came from because it not, has no origin. Do not let the pictures in, and then you won't have to work hard to get them out. So the final example was the healing my mom had. Some of you may know this story. She's had some amazing healings. And this was towards the end of her life. I, excuse me. She's still living. <laughs> this was when she was in her 70s. And and um, she was working full time in her 70s. And she had a very serious fall down some marble steps. But she's a practitioner and a teacher. She was a lecturer. So she's healed many people. And she went right back to work and just kept praying. But she was very busy with her work. So she said, OK, I'm praying about it. But it got worse and worse. It got to the point where she couldn't work anymore, and she had to quit. So she went home, and she was just praying. She'd healed many things, but it was not being healed. And it got so bad that she no longer could care for herself. She had to have a nurse come in, other people. She couldn't feed herself. She couldn't move. Seemed to be excruciating pain. And the picture looked like she wouldn't last long. In fact, during this time, she said the thoughts coming to her, remember the dragon and his angels, the negative thoughts coming to her were so aggressive. They were you're older, you're in your 70s, you've lived a long life, why are you holding on, just give up and die, nobody's going to say anything? She realized that, suicide. That's not what Jesus taught. Jesus taught us to overcome the belief of death, not submit to it, because there is no death. All you do is wake up and see, wait a second, nothing changed. Life is like a schoolroom. Life is like going to college. You don't go to college and get A's and then C's and D's and F's and fail out. If your teachers are doing your job and their job and you're doing your job, you're going to get better and better each year and then graduate, from, uh, graduate with honors or at least graduate and be able to go on to your job. You may move to Australia and people will not see you anymore, but they know you're doing good work. We don't stay in this human existence forever, but you continue growing. And you have the right to express more and more dominion every year, more and more strength. And when you finish your work here, you progress on. But there is no death. If you don't handle the belief now, you'll have to handle it later, the Bible says. The suggestion will keep coming back. So she refused to give in to that. The thing is, the picture was so overwhelming and so... There was so much pain, it was very hard for her, her to, to put up with it. But she said a couple of things helped her. One was the practitioner that was helping her never gave up, never became discouraged. In fact, every time she called, no matter how serious, how painful, the practitioner always said, but, but honey, God is right there with you. God is your life. You can never be separated from God. God does not create pain. God is caring for you right now. And my mom said that, that gentleness, that patience, that confidence is what kept her going. She didn't give up. The practitioner give up, didn't give up, so my mother didn't. And there's a passage in here at the beginning, right before Mental Treatment Illustrated. If you look at page 410, it says, 
the more difficult seems the material condition to be overcome by spirit, the stronger should be our faith and the purer our love. And she, it's right there in the middle. And she said she realized, okay, those are the two great commandments. The stronger should be our faith, faith that God is all know, the purer our love, loving her fellow man. And so she was refusing to give up, and she realized she needed to purify her sense of love. Now, my mom's a very loving person, but she's also very intelligent. And it's so simple. I know I struggled with this when I was an attorney. You know how you go, okay, God, I have everything under control. If I need you, I'll call on you. <laughs> it's not the way it works. We do God's will. But a lot of times, you know, and all of you are very intelligent, so maybe you found yourself going, you know, I need to control those people, and I need to tell these people, you know, and that sense of not realizing that God's in control. That's what she realized. She needed to let go. She needed to trust that God was the one in control of her family, her work, everybody. She didn't need to be. And she felt she needed to deepen her understanding of God as love, to be more grateful, more patient, more um, uh, loving. And it's not as if she could do anything. She was just kind of lying there being cared for. But she began focusing her prayers on deepening her understanding of this pure sense of God's love for everybody. And she said the more she purified her love, the more she felt her spiritual roots deepening. And she didn't even notice the pain until the pain began going away. Her strength and her weight began coming back. Pretty soon, she was completely healed but it wasn't a healing of this body part or that body part or this. It was a whole new sense of God as our life, God's spirit, eternally, uninterrupted, continuous, all acting, all knowing, all seeing. Well, she went back to work. In her late 70s, she lectured on five continents in four months. Now she's almost 90 in a few months, and has a very heavy caseload from all over the world, writes articles. She has seen over and over again now that when we understand that God is our life and we refuse to give up, then we too can prove that life is eternal right here, right now. That we have the ability to prove that there is no condemnation, no incurability to those who keep their confidence in the Christ message of perfect God, perfect man, it delivers us from disease and sin and death. Mrs. Eddy says on page 496, hold perpetually this thought, that it is the spiritual idea, the Holy Ghost in Christ, that enables you to demonstrate with scientific certainty the rule of healing based upon its divine principle Love, underlying, overlying, and encompassing all true being. Thank you. Now, we went over a little bit. Would you want to take time for two questions? If you need to leave, that's okay. Is there a, I'll take two questions. Uh, anybody have a question they'd like to ask? Is life not, boy, is life about challenges. But you know what makes it challenging? Is believing that there's a power apart from God. And it, it would be like if, um, it would be like saying, well, you know, what would life be like if you didn't go to first grade and keep failing? That's not life. Life is, yes, you're presented with a challenge, and maybe you keep adding wrong. But as soon as you learn the principle, you should be able to add correctly and move to subtraction, and then to division and you know, multiplication. You shouldn't stay at the same place with 
making mistakes over and over again and then failing out. Yeah, every year you go to school and do math, it's going to be challenging, but it's also going to be wonderful because you do have a law of mathematics you can learn and put into practice. And as you learn it and put it into practice, you're able to do better and better. That's what this science is about. Yep, it's going to be challenging each step of progress because you're learning new things. You have to overcome fears and misconceptions, but when you do, you progress to the next level. And at the next level, there are new problems, but they have nothing to do with you. They're not personal. They're opportunities to understand the principle of being, put it into practice, and progress to the next level. But challenge should not be equated with nonstop suffering. Just because you had hard problems in math class didn't mean you suffered through it all. You have an ability to, it can be exciting to have new problems, new opportunities, and to overcome it. It shouldn't be suffering and hopelessness and, and, and pain. It's challenges that move us forward. So that's a good question. Did you have a question? Excellent, thank you. I'll repeat her question, and, uh, and I'm glad she mentioned it because I usually mention it in the talk. For the community at large and the medical community, when they talk about healing, what they're meaning is a person gets a sense of peace. She said they come to terms with their disease. They accept that they're going to die, but they have a sense of peace that life will go on, that God loves them, whatever. And that's healing, when they get that sense of peace. Cure is when the disease goes away. In Christian science, and, and definitely that's what I'm talking about, because I, when I talk to Harvard Medical School or any of the others, I'm going there next week, and, and that's what we talk about, is in Christian science, when we talk about healing, we're talking about cure, but more than that. Christian science is not only therapeutic, it is preventative. Since we are not working from the basis that disease is real and we've got to find something to get rid of it, but we're working from the basis that there's one creator, one mind, one creation. That creation is entirely good eternally. The divine creative intelligence of the universe maintains his creation. And let me give you one example I usually share in the lecture, but it gets so long. This is, answer, this is an example I like for myself. I don't know if it'll help you. But the whole idea that man is material makes no sense whatsoever. The idea that man is material and is going to have physical problems, diseases, and then the diseases will finally kill him makes no sense whatsoever. And this is, this is the way I kind of explain it to myself. I used to drive a Saturn. Maybe you have a car like this, where for seven years I had the Saturn, never had any problems. I could drive it anywhere. I took it in to be serviced and clean and everything, but it never had problems. Now, how is it that human beings, with all their limitations and problems and can create a car that doesn't have problems when the divine creative intelligence of this exquisite universe that is so perfect, why can that divine creative intelligence not create man, the highest expression of intelligence, without non-stop problems? Would you buy a car from a manufacturer who said to you, okay, the car's almost ready, it's on the assembly line, it keeps breaking down, but..." It, we're, we're working on it. Okay, it's ready now. You can come pick it up. Now, this car should last for 20 years. It, it'll probably break in 15. It might break in 10. In fact, the way things are going these years, it'll probably break sooner. But we have just bring it in every month, and we'll keep repairing things, and it'll go for a while. Now, the engine works great, but it's probably going to break. Let's replace it right now. <laughs> Even though it functions well, let's replace it. That's insanity. <laughs> that does not make any sense. You would never buy a car. And yet, we have bought the belief that man goes through a birth process where they keep saying, oh, the baby's got this kind of problem. We're going to have to inject with this. We're going to have to have a C-section. They never did C-sections before. 
He never did C-sections before. There's no reason why childbirth should have all these problems. It's a natural unfoldment. I go to Africa all the time. My daughter was in the Peace Corps in Africa. She wanted to see a birth. She missed it. They said that the young woman just went to have her baby. She got on the bicycle, rode over there. Oh, no, she just had it. She's back on her bike, heading back to the fields. <laughs> That's always been the case. You have your baby, you go back to work. It's become a disease in this country because it's big money. But this idea that the, you can't even get to the birth process without there being problems, and then when the baby comes, inject it with diseases. I know it's healthy, but it'll help it to inject. Doctors have called me asking for our exemption, our, our right to not have, um, our privilege to not have inoculations if we're praying in Christian science, because doctors have told me they do not want their children to have inoculations. The only reason they give them is because their patients ask for them. But they're injecting healthy children with them. And they're saying, oh, now you're going to have this disease and that disease. And every step of the way, you're told you're going to have problems. And that you're not going to live to this age or that age. That doesn't make sense. How can a human being create a car that doesn't have problems, but the most intelligent creation in this human experience has nonstop problems? But you don't have to. Christian science is preventative because you begin from the basis, God doesn't create disease. I am a manifestation, you are a manifestation of the one divine mind that communicates only health, harmony, love, peace, right thinking, right acting. What is the result? You don't get problems. You don't get problems. Yes, challenges come along, but you know what brings the challenges along? Resentment, irritation, stress. But when you are doing the two great commandments, obedience to the two great commandments, loving God supremely, when you're whole, from the time you get up, when you're asleep at night, whatever, it's bringing your thoughts in line with divine love, letting God, divine love, govern your thoughts and actions, and letting embrace everyone around you. When you see everybody as God's precious child, then the healings are quick or you don't even have the problems to come up. And people who have begun, like my dad, before he began practicing Christian science, suffered from severe migraine headaches for years as a young man and as a child that when he started trying to get jobs, it kept him from getting jobs. They were so awful, he'd cry out. But once he started studying Christian science, that was the end of the migraine headaches, when he learned who he was and who the source of his being was. And, and after that, he just didn't even have problems. Later in life, he seemed to develop a, a, um, a, a tumor or something, and a, a friend of his who was a surgeon said, that's going to kill you if you don't have that removed. And he said, I'm having it treated. And he prayed in Christian science. And shortly after that, it just drained and went away. And he went on with work. Yeah. Could you give us some beautiful thoughts uh, on the challenges of the economy now and the belief that all these people, well, I mean, it seems as though people are experiencing the loss of their Yeah. Home, which everybody needs a home. Well, and the Bible is full from beginning to end of examples of how people were able to overcome lack of supply much more severe than that. And my friends in Africa who have very little, what happens is in this country, we start thinking we have so much here. We start thinking our security is in that big bank account we have and the nice big house we have. And then when those go, we think we've lost everything, but that was never the source of our supply. Our supply never came from a bank account, never came from a salary, never came from an employer. It comes from God. And all you have to do is look at the Bible. It's full of examples. Elisha and Elijah and Moses and Jesus producing food, producing supply, money for taxes where there was none because they all understood that God's Spirit is the source of all 
supply of all resources, infinite resources, and they're always available, but they come in the form of ideas. And that's a whole nother lecture that I have. There are tons of examples, but I've held you a long time. The main thing to remember is God's spirit is all in all. You are one with your maker. You're a manifestation of that divine intelligence, divine goodness, and the Christ is the, is the message from divine love meeting the human need. It is speaking to the human consciousness every moment. It's a still small voice, silence the fear, silence the negativism and the skepticism and doubt. Listen for that still small voice and you will find you will always have whatever you need to prove God's ever-present love and life right here and now. So thank you all very much.